wondering, did Tingana manage to at least eat some of his carcass yesterday, since you missed the sunset safari? Yes, he did. He did eat it. He did eat a little bit of it, not scoffing into it like a uh, bless you, Bill. Um, not sort of tucking into it in the same way a hungry leopard might do, but he did feed on it. We'll go and investigate. Now that it's light enough, we'll go and investigate. In the meantime, Brent has found the lions. Well, guess what we found? A bunch of smelly looking lions. So these are the guys who are calling. So I think they've walked straight through the center of Juma. We have now found them right on our eastern boundary. Look at them. They look like they've been eating something, or at least rolling in something. So we've got four out of the five boys. And there's one lying on the other side of the road, and there's three on our side of the road. And I'm hoping they still give one or two more roars in the early morning. So we don't really need the spotlight there. Hello, big boys. So I think this is what was harassing buffalo around the pan last night. Unfortunately, they weren't successful. Wouldn't it be nice if they caught a buffalo on our doorstep? Oh, he's had a busy night. Head's getting heavy. Oh, there we go. Located for Birmingham and Gola, Twin Downs Junction, Gary, Maine. Good morning. I'm approaching the place for the Kingway. I'll let you know now. Copy, thanks. Small for my daughter there. FM for my daughter here. Thanks. Oh, look at that, Dad. Can you spot the jet plane? Now, right on the horizon, cutting through the cold air. And that is more than likely coming from, uh, I'm going to guess this is the London flight. And it lands at about 6 a.m. in Johannesburg and flies directly over this part of the world. So a big safari live welcome to Barbara, who's a brand new viewer. And she's wondering how I know she's been posting and she doesn't see any Bluetooth device for me to see what she's saying. Well, we have directors who sit in our final control and they send us through the questions and they watch the different forms of social media and email. So guys, I just need to give a quick update on the Eastern Channel, because we're on the boundary. Oh, not bull ducks flying, Dave, in the silhouette. So, here we go, we're going to go get them. There they go. A little off to go the not bull ducks in search of some pans. Uh, morning stations in the East, is anyone copying me? Uh, at four, Birmingham, my daughter's Gary Main uh, Junction with Twin Dams or Baboon Pan. Uh, one station here and one another station from the north making their way, space for one. Uh, be, uh, be my way to be mobile number two. Copy, thanks. Uh, if you can't get hold of me, I'm going to be jumping between the two channels to make sure we don't get too many more vis uh, like last time the Ngalo here. Uh, morning, Fijian Southern Drive. We'll pick up. Update, so guys, unfortunately, I have to put my radio on scan because we're right on the boundary between the east and the north, so to speak. So to make sure we can manage it properly, uh, I've got to jump between channels and 
a lot of the guys in the east don't have the northern channel. So I do apologize for the radio chatter that's going to be happening. So just as I was waking up this morning and Jamie and I were walking towards the car, we heard these guys calling in the distance. So Sandra says, look how beat up these boys are looking. I don't think too beat up. I think they caught something small and uh, they've had a big fight over the meat that's there. And you can actually see if we zoom in on these two particularly, you can see there looks like there's blood and stomach contents on them. They are looking a little bit manky this morning, not looking very pretty, but they've obviously had a snack overnight. And also walking through the dew gives them a slightly bedraggled look as well. Stations in the north, I've kept one space open for anyone who'd like to come to these Birmingham Madodas. Okay, copy, thanks very much. Sorry guys, as soon as someone else gets here, I'll hand over the control of the radio, but till then, uh, it's just me here, so I do have to make sure that everyone gets the best and most fair chance to see these boys. Now, fingers crossed that they decide to give us one more bout of roaring before it gets too warm. So the fifth Birmingham has been on honeymoon and he's been mating with an Nkuma lioness, and I think that's probably the one that is not here at the moment. But from what I heard, they finished mating yesterday, and that one Nkuma lioness did head back into Juma. So we will try have a look for them a little later, but I think for now, let's stick with these fat, lazy, big boys. And we can see those paws. So those are what we were following down the road with the tracks left by them. And on nice dewy mornings, they, they do, do shine very nicely. Hey, so I'm going to have to have a bout of serious game drive chatter, so I'm sure you guys don't want to listen to that. So we're going to jump across to, to Jamie while I just deal with that radio quickly. Okay, so we've got news on Tingana while Sprint is just sorting out game drive comms, and that is the fact that he's lost his kill. We're not sure how, I'm just listening to Taxon on the radio, but it seems as though he has lost that kill. This wildebeest was calling on quarantine. I don't think it was an alarm call though. I think it was more a territorial call. Just have a look at him since he's presenting such a beautiful view to us. See how black the face is all the way to the top of the horns? That plus the fact that they extend past the ears, if he looks at us at some point. It's not always immediately apparent if you're looking at a female or a male wildebeest. 
In this case, it's a lone male making his way quite possibly to go and have a drink around the Juma Dam pan. Oh, <laughs> I love it when they do that. He's having a great time. That's a combination of dust feeling good around his parasites and itches and the fact that he has a pre-orbital scent gland just around his eyes. So very common for wildebeest to rub their heads against trees, particularly where they have a sort of a regular midden site, as I'm sure most of you know. Wildebeest, male wildebeest have a different approach. Rather than trying to collect females, they like to defend a territory. And the better the territory, the more appropriate it is, and therefore the more females they're going to attract. So obviously, territory like this, lots of grass, lots of water, is a really good place to be. Albeit you have to share with a couple of buffalo. Let's just see if any of them decide to chase him grumpily. Ah, oh, he's not taking any chances. He's going to dash right past them. <laughs> is he? It is a really, truly beautiful morning. So yes, he definitely was in the process of um, defending his territory. So that, that rubbing against the sand was a combination of scent mark marking as well as just enjoying a morning dust bath. The reason he sprinted past the buffalo is because buffalo are notoriously grumpy. And they have been known to chase other animals, including wildebeest. There was that amazing situation with Brent and the brand new wildebeest calf that was only a couple of minutes old that promptly got walked past a buffalo, made its first big mistake in life. Luckily, not the worst mistake it could have made. Walked past a buffalo and the buffalo immediately knocked it over with its horns. The baby wildebeest demonstrating that incredible ability of young mammals to spring back up again. But nevertheless, an important lesson in that young wildebeest life, and who knows, maybe our wildebeest that ran past the buffalo has also learned that particular lesson at some point in his life. It's the same group of buffalo that I saw yesterday. I'm sure I saw a zebra as well. But I'm faced with a very empty clearing, which suggests maybe not. I'm going to go on and search and see if I can't figure out where Tingana went from his kill site while I do that. Let's go back across to Brent and his lions. So we've got one raised head. Oh, very slightly raised before back down. And there's not much that can really sleep like a male lion. I mean, there's not much to challenge a male lion out here apart from possibly another male lion. The only thing that'll really chase them when they're in this type of spot and having a nap would be elephants. So it looks like they traversed around a lot of Juma last night chasing buffalo. And unfortunately, as I said, I think they did catch something small, just judging by the mess around a lot of their faces. But nothing big, so whatever it was, it's all gone. Now, big male lions like this have a huge appetite, and they're able to engulf up to about 15 kilograms of meat in a single sitting. So, Red, who's a brand new viewer on YouTube, welcome to Safari Live, and um, is saying, do, when lions lie around like this, does it mean they have just eaten? Not necessarily. Lions are not the most energetic of creatures, and they're designed to be so. They, only, they sleep for about 20 hours out of 24, so they can be quite lazy. Lazy is the wrong word. They have a great difficulty in dealing with heat, and that is why they're mostly nocturnal, and they'll do a lot of their moving at, at night, and that moving will also be 
in little bouts. They'll normally move and walk for 20 minutes, half an hour, lie down for 20 minutes, half an hour. And during the daylight hours, you'll probably find them sleeping for the majority of the daylight hours. Sometimes now in the early morning, you might find them moving. But as it gets warmer, I'll find a nice shady spot and spend the day sleeping. So Jamie's going to have a look where Tingana had that impala kill last night. And it wasn't the hyena who stole his impala. Apparently, the tracks of these lions went straight into where his kill was and disappeared with what was left of his impala. So that's probably what they snacked on last night. So, a big Safari Live welcome to Maddie, who's a brand new viewer on YouTube. Uh, Maddie would like to know why the lions don't seem to care about us being here. Well, Maddie, very, very simple explanation, because we're in a car. If we were on foot, it would be a very different story. Uh, they would probably run away from us on foot. Humans are the... Oh, bless you. The dominant diurnal animal is the human being, so they are, have a certain amount of respect for us in daylight hours. Oh, shh, 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 shh. they're gonna roar. Let's stay on him, he looks like he's about to roar. Dave, a slight little, mm. like he might think about it. But no, <laughs> that doesn't mean, oh. No, back to snoozing. Let me just finish off with Maddie's question. Sorry, we got sidetracked there a little bit. So Maddie's wondering why they don't worry about us in, the, in a car. Now, a car's only been around for about 100 years, uh, just over 100 years, and they don't have an instinctive response to a car like they would to a hu the upright bipedal figure of a human being. So a car also doesn't smell like anything particularly appetizing. It smells like diesel or petrol and oil and it's just this big thing it doesn't smell like food it doesn't act like food and if you drive carefully they become very very used to the vehicles like these are and they pretty much ignore them so it is great to be able to spend time with these animals and in an area like the Sabi Sands we've these lines of Probably, and they come from the Timbervati, which is another game reserve. These lions have spent their whole lives since young cubs being viewed on game drive vehicles. So it is just normal for them. Aqua has noticed that the lions almost have a little bit of makeup under their eyes, that really white sort of stance there. Now, you'll notice that on leopards as well. And a lot of nocturnal animals will have that there, and it's to help catch as much ambient light in the darkness as possible.
As we've mentioned many, many times, uh, cheetah will have the opposite. They've got dark under their eyes because they are mainly diurnal hunters. Natasha, who's in Ontario, is wondering, can lions swim? They can. They don't particularly like it sometimes, but in certain parts of Africa, they're forced to cross lots of different rivers and lakes, like in northern Botswana, in the Okavango Delta. They are forced to swim quite regularly. So there, those lions swim. Here, you'll find that the lions swim very infrequently. And we do... I have seen them swim in the Sabi Sands before, crossing the Sand River, and it's quite a sight because they seem to hiss at the water, and the, the, the lions here have a very big, healthy respect for crocodiles. So, Sophia, who's a brand new viewer on YouTube, says, Hi guys, I'm new here. What's going on? What is this thing that's happening? Well, Sophia, welcome to a live African safari. We're sitting in the heart of, of the Lofalt in the Greater Kruger National Park, and we're sitting next to four male lions having a snooze live. So you're seeing these at the same time as me. Sorry, guys, I just need to get onto the radio again quickly. So just excuse me. Abel, Abel. I'm for a new farm over with, we'll call tax in. Is Orbs out yet? I'm not enough. Okay, copy, thanks. So guys, well, Jamie's got some female lion tracks. Let's go have a look while I deal with the logistics of running a sighting. I did have, I promise you, I did have lioness tracks about two seconds ago. And I think they've just gone off the road. Hold on one second. I just want to check further up ahead, make sure that they don't come back on. Otherwise, we'll go back and I'll show you the tracks that I was talking about. Been tracking them all the way up into the road, just to the point that Brent sent you back over to me. Mm. No, she's gone off the road. Okay, so let's go back and I'll show you the tracks that I was talking about and then I will continue to track her. It must be that lioness that they saw crossing onto the property yesterday, trying to relocate the rest of the Nkuhuma pride. I'm just making sure that she's not in the road somewhere ahead of me. These tracks are very, very fresh. Sorry, Liam. Didn't mean to bash you on the head of the branch. Watch out. There you go. Tracks on top of all of the vehicle tracks, every other track on the road, and crisp and clear in this morning light. So whenever she... I think she walked along this road relatively recently in the last few hours or so. There's a good chance, you know the way that lions walk, they cover a little bit of distance and then they stop and they lie down for a rest. Hopefully we catch her before she decides to cross either across our western or across our east, uh, northern boundary. Right. She must have gone off. Hmm? Ah. Liam thinks he spotted where she lay down. able to get that on camera perfect beautiful 
There you go, her track right in the middle. Thank you, Vian. Well spotted. And there, this ground all scuffed. And in fact, it looks, I'm trying to work out if it looks like more than one individual. We thought we saw two sets of tracks initially, but then when I started following them down the road, they'd moved. Okay, so she's cut into, onto that game path from where they were lying down, straight to the north there, where you see that path that runs up into the block. Animals, as you know, like to use paths. It's slightly easier, it's the same reason that they like to use roads. It is an easier passage, it's quieter, and it means less of moving through an area. Well spotted, Viam. Awesome. This is why we have such great cameramen. They can help us track as well as film everything that we're doing. Let's go see if we can't find her. Last we heard, the Nkuhuma pride was on Manuleti, apart from the female that was wandering across Juma. Let's go onto Aubrey's road and see if we can't track her. Unless she's hiding in there somewhere. Now we've got to know our lions of this area very, very well. And TB Stain was actually wondering how many lions do we have? There she is, got her. I had a feeling those tracks were so fresh. Can you see her there, Viam? She's, you got her. Hey! Lion day today. Exciting stuff. Let's go and make our way a little bit closer. Viam, that was some good teamwork there. Hee <laughs> hee. That's terribly exciting. Unfortunately, it's a very thick block, so we're going to have to make our way in, or find our way in here. While we work our way a little bit closer to her, let's go back over to Brent and his lions. Whoa, what a lion morning. Jamie's just found the girls. I'm not sure exactly where. So we've got the boys and the girls out and about on Juma this morning. So exciting stuff. And Jamie's just going to offer a little bit to try to get closer to that lioness. And then we'll be able to have a look who it is. I'm pretty sure it might be one of the Nkuhuma ladies who was mating with these boys. So what's going to happen, these guys, I think they're pretty much done moving for the for the, for the evening or for the morning. The only movement they're going to do from here is when it gets a bit warm, they're going to find some shade. Hopefully they find some shade back towards our side and don't venture further to the south. But unfortunately, it seems that their patrol normally goes further to the south uh, than to the north. They've already come through from around quarantine where they were chasing buffalo. So it must have been quite a spectacular scene if these four male lions stole Mr. Tingana's dinner. So he would have made quick, quick time getting away from there. And the fight that would have ensued with four male lions fighting over such a small carcass as an impala would have been quite incredible. And that's why we've got this very dirty face. They've got some stomach contents on them. They've got a bit of blood. So it is, would have been really, really interesting. But a male leopard would have got out of there very quickly. I don't think he would have even looked over his shoulder at four male lions advancing.
we look on this guy here, you can see some of that sort of stomach content and whatnot I was talking about and on his face. So that would have been from feeding and fighting. These boys are very, very sleepy. Sorry, guys, I do need to get onto the Game Drive channel again to, to organize the logistics. So these guys aren't moving. So we're going to see if we can go back to Jamie while I sort out um, the pandemonium that's ensuing on the Game Drive channel. Here we go. We have attempted to squeeze our way in here. It is very, very thick. There are, in fact, two lionesses here. That looks like amber eyes. Is that? No, it's not. I thought it was amber eyes. It isn't. But I'm fairly certain it's one of the Gahuma lionesses. The second is lying up to the left, unfortunately, very much behind a bush. As you can see, the vegetation is very thick here, so we can't get too much closer at the moment. But I don't, I don't think that they're actually going to stay here. I think that they're going to carry on moving, probably try and look for the rest of their pride. Hello, girl. Yes, I see you looking. Here are the rest of your ladies. What a wonderful start to the morning. And the nice thing is nobody wants to come to our lionesses, so we've got them all to ourselves. Yep, she's getting up. <laughs> now, Phil has suggested that one of our lionesses... Oh, no, she's not getting up. She's lying down again. <laughs> um, Phil has suggested one of our lionesses might be having a secret meeting with Birmingham boy number five, quite possibly continuing to broker the peace deal that has been established between these lionesses and the males that Brent has. They have been seen mating over the last few months, different individuals at different times. The last one we saw was, when was that? It was about 10 days ago, around Twin Dams, before she rejoined the rest of her pride and he moved off to rejoin his brothers and cousins. Now, the Inkahumas seem to split and come back together on a very regular basis. Not always necessarily connected to the movements of the Birmingham boys. And it does sometimes beg the question that some of them are not disappearing off to mate with the Birmingham boys, particularly when all Birmingham boys are present and accounted for, but also the possibility that they are sneaking in mating sessions with other males of the surrounding areas. Why do I say that? Well, that's what Re recent research has shown is that lionesses, just like female leopards, will attempt to mate with as many males as possible in order to ensure the survival of their cubs. So that basically every single male within a nearby vicinity that, or that they might possibly encounter could be tricked into thinking that they are the father of the cubs. I'm trying to work out exactly which lionesses they are, but for those of you who get the closer view from the camera, if you could let me know and just confirm that it is the Nkuhuma lionesses, that would be hugely helpful. Now, we were very lucky to spot the tawny lionesses lying down right behind a termite mound. They are so beautifully camouflaged, particularly when she has her head down like that. Thank goodness she looked up at us as we drove past. Although I think I probably would have walked from that position otherwise. But say what was wondering, do lionesses get different colored coats at different times of the year? Or do lions? The answer is no, they don't. 
Their coat color will change more with age and will be, will be varied depending on the area that you're watching lions in. When they are born, when they are young cubs, they are quite spotty. They're covered in little spots all over them, particularly the belly and the legs, as an extra degree of camouflage for them when, when they're at their sort of most vulnerable. As they start to grow older, those spots almost, but never quite, disappear. But once they've reached their adult coloring, that is what they will stay at for the rest of their lives. They might go, some lionesses go a little bit paler as they get older. And male lions very often go darker. Their manes grow darker with age. So the Birmingham boys from, the, from November when I saw one for the last time in the space of about two and a half months, have, their manes have filled out tremendously and they have gone darker with time. I know that I'm sure many of you wish to get, want to get another view of the lioness that's at the back. I promise you that I will try and get there. It's just going to be a rather interesting experience. Here you go. You can see her in the process of licking her foot. You can just see the flashes of movement in the sun behind her. And in fact, I'd like to get onto the other side of them at some point to try and view them from in this beautiful morning light, because it is a stunning morning. In this thick green vegetation. Oh. TB Stain, you were just comparing our sighting between Brent's Birmingham boys and our lionesses. And you were wondering, are lionesses in general cleaner than the males? It depends what they've been doing. I, Yes, to an extent. Actually, now that you mention it, I have noticed that lionesses tend to be a little bit cleaner. That being said, if they're busy feeding off a carcass, they aren't terribly concerned by being covered in bits of carcass and stomach contents and whatever else they happen to be. Now, it's very hard for me while they're lying down at this distance to tell you exactly how full they are or when last they ate, but they are looking relatively clean compared to... And when I last saw the Birmingham boys, they were also looking... I think a grubby is probably the best description I could give them, but it depends on what the lion's doing, and I don't think there's any great difference between the hygiene of a male versus a female. I mean, at the moment, the female at the back, though you can't see her, is clearly having a jolly good clean. Now, licking of the paws like that, if they start to yawn, and if both lionesses start licking their feet, then there is a good chance that they're going to get up. Personally, I don't think they're going to stay here. I think that they are... I think they are planning on carrying on. They just happen to lie down for a quick break. I'm just listening to the Game Drive channel quickly. listening to Ephraim chatting a bit about maybe looking for Tingana and whether or not he's found any drag marks leading away from the carcass. From what we can tell, as I said earlier, it seems as though, or as Brent I'm sure has mentioned, it seems as though the lion stole Tingana's kill last night. So this time, not the hyena responsible for the theft, but either the lionesses that we're looking at now or the male lions that Brent is seeing, there's tracks leading away from that sighting. Now while I try now while I try and reposition, let's go back across to Brent and find out what he thinks or who he thinks stole Tingana's kill. So these big boys have not moved an inch since you were last here. The beautiful morning light has descended upon them there, making them look a little bit more pretty in their scruffiness this morning.
So Eileen has noticed that their noses still look a little bit pink, so she thinks they must be quite young, even though they are the dominant males. Well, Eileen, they're, they're around six now, and pink noses and lines is, a, is, is not a very accurate way to, to age a lion. I've seen lions that I've known are well over 10 years old with pink noses. So it's a very general rule and not a very, a very good rule. Uh, you do find animals with, that have pink noses throughout their lives. But uh, normally in a lot of lions, their noses do go black the older they get or, or darker. But in this case, you can see he's six and he's still got a pink nose. Where are my binoculars now? I thought I spotted something. So, Dad, then, you see this guy who's got his back to us? Mm. It looks like he's got a little bit of a wound behind his ear there. Where have I put my binoculars? So, there we go. That looks quite fresh as well. Just have a quick look. Um, mm, looks like... It is quite fresh, and you probably find that's from fighting with his coalition mates over that small impala last night that they stole from Mr. Tingana. That doesn't look too serious, just a superficial... superficial wound. Now, it does look like they are just fast, fast asleep. So Bill and Marsha are wondering about social dynamics in male lions. Is the oldest the most dominant? Um, is he here? Is he off mating? Well, it's generally the most aggressive is the most dominant, and that can change. So there's a constant sort of shifting in male coalitions, uh, with dominance varying between the different individuals depending on the exact moment or time. So at the moment, while they're all lying like this, and there's no female to fight over or no food to fight over, it's very difficult to distinguish which one is, is dominant. And a lot of those dominance plays, etc., only become important when there's a female or food to fight over. So Karen, who's in Pickering, would like to know about male lion's manes and how long do they take to grow, when do they start showing, etc., etc. So you can see the mane start developing even from quite young, from below a year, but just a little sort of tuft underneath the uh, the chin, so to speak, and a little tuft behind the ears. And it is a, a sign of testosterone. So it's testosterone that causes uh, the mane, and the darker the mane, the, the higher the testosterone level in the lion. And in research in Tanzania, the darker the male mane's lion, um, the more pr preferential mating he gets, the females actually seek out darker male lions and they seem to have a longer mating life than the blondies. Now, they can continue to grow throughout uh, a lion's life, but 
you could probably say from anything from about now, six, six years, five, six years, that they are fully developed. So guys, I don't think they're going to move too much. So we have had a spectacular sighting and there are lots of people waiting to come see these lions. And I think we're probably going to move off shortly. And see what else we can find in this glorious morning light. And so we're going to leave these big boys. We will be, we might come check on them a little bit later, but as I said, this is about the most action they're going to show for now. So let's go see what the Inkahuma girls are up to with Jamie. Now, I haven't had a chance to reposition just yet. We were just making sure that our camera lens was clean and free of any dust and rubbish. But the lionesses are still here. Oh. The one lioness is showing signs of skittishness. She's been, not this lioness that's lying down, obviously. She's quite happily fast asleep. But the other that's still at the back there keeps lifting her head and keeping a very close eye. Not so, not so much on me, but I think the sounds of an elephant herd moving across behind us. I can't tell you exactly where those sounds are coming from. It sounds as though they're across the road on the other side of the block. Also just been trying to listen to the Game Drive channel. Ephraim, it seems, had a brief visual of a male leopard close to Buffles Hook Dam. But it seems as though it's that very skittish male that's been hanging out there because he said that he saw it and immediately the leopard moved away from him. So uh, they could well be there. I do want to try and reposition. Um, there's a lot of trees and bushes, so it is going to make a little bit of a noise. So let's just stick with these lionesses for now with the view that we have. One very sleeping looking lioness. I also want to try and double check that it is just the two of them and not the rest of them hiding further in the block. Sandra is one of our newer viewers and would like to know a little bit about the dynamics of the lion prides in this area and how many and which ones. She said that she's a little bit too new to know them all just yet. Sandra, my suspicion is that this is an Nkuhuma lioness, Nkuhuma being the local name for a tree known as a brown ivory tree. Now this pride initially, when I first started working here, was a pride of eight strong with six lionesses, two sub-adult lionesses, and one sub-adult male. Apparently it was nine just a few months previously to that, or prior to that, when there was another adult lioness. Now, two of the lionesses killed by the Birmingham boys, one of the sub-adult lionesses also killed in the process of that whole takeover. We're left with five lionesses, four fully grown lionesses and the one surviving sub-adult lioness that has now reached adulthood. The last member of the pride that has now moved off was a male called Junior, who was part of this pride. He was just at that age where he was going to start dispersing anyway. He was around three years old when the Birmingham boy takeover occurred. And as a result, because the, the lionesses were attempting to protect him and because it is such a dangerous thing for a lion pride to have a young male with them, because all of the males in the area will target him as potential competition. It was a time when the lionesses, the Nkuhuma lionesses, were basically gone from our lives for a while. They were running scared. But eventually, Junior moved off. The lionesses started mating with... Just let the Franklin finish their conversation. Ooh. There's an angry elephant somewhere, trumpeting in the distance. Could be what's made the lionesses a bit skittish. 
but yes, sorry, back to the Pride. Junior moved off. The Inkahumas started mating with the Birmingham boys as a sort of a plus, um, in order to placate them and to pl classify them. The takeover has now been successful, and we're probably anticipating in the next two or so months potential new arrivals to the Inkahuma Pride to boost their numbers. So as it stands, five lionesses, one just about um, reaching adulthood. Now, there's also the Styx Pride, the Styx Pride that we see in this region. The Styx Pride has three lionesses that we've seen recently. All three are heavily pregnant as a result of the takeover. Now, we could be also expecting new arrivals from them. There's the five Birmingham boys, four of which you saw this morning with Brent. There's a fifth one off somewhere doing something, possibly with a lioness, possibly just moving off on his own. Male coalitions do split and come together like that very regularly. There's also the Salala Pride, or the, yes, the Salala Pride. Three sub-adult young males, one tailless lioness and one lioness or two other lionesses, depending. They've also been in a bit of a state of flux because the Birmingham boy takeover, when they moved into this area, they actually kicked out two males known as the Matimba males. The Matimba males crossed south to Londolozi, and by the way, they are both fine and well. After that fight with the Majingalans, there was a moment that they were considered, one of them were, was considered possibly badly injured, if not dead, but he seems to be fine. But they went into the Londolozi area, so to the south of us, and essentially did what the Birmingham boys did to the Nkuhumas, which was terrorize the Salala pride a little bit, particularly the Salalas with the three young sub-adult males. So they pushed up into this area for a while. Now that's, those are generally our key players within the lion grouping around here. There's, odd, there's additional players. There's the Salati males to the north in Buffels Hook. We hardly ever see them. We've seen them about twice. One of whom has got quite a bad limp and has had a bad limp for months now, but is still doing fine. There's also the, the Talamati pride with a couple of youngsters, or quite a few cubs of around, I think there's around eight of the cubs, seven or eight of them. We've never seen them. I've never seen them. I don't think they've ever been seen on the live shows, but we could potentially, depending on how lion territories fluctuate over the next few months. I don't think so, though. And that some, largely sums up our main line players in this area. Diana, I don't know. I don't know that these are the Nkuhuma lionesses. It's very hard for me to judge at the moment with this view, with one with her head, well, both with their heads down. I suspect it's them. I can't tell you for absolute certain. I'm guessing it's them because of the current position that we're in. The Styx females, whilst they do come up towards the Juma Pan, have recently remained far further to the south. So right in the sort of central core area of their home range. They overlap with the Inkahumas, basically around Juma and Arethusa, and Cheetah Plains as well, and Coral Side, so to the southeast of where we are now. And they have come into conflict before. Now, just seeing two here, and I can only see two, and I don't think there are any others hiding away, I can't tell you for absolute certain that it is the Inkahumas. I think it is. When it comes to identifying individual lions, a lot of them have nice nicks and scars. You, you factor in different combinations. One is the area that they're in, which makes it more likely that it's the Inkahuma lionesses. Two is their whisker spot patterns. So the dark spots along where they, the rows of their whiskers remain the same throughout their lives. So you can actually, if you're looking for the proper scientific method, that would be how you go about it. And then a lot of our, I mean, our viewers have come to know, and we've come to know the Nkumas very, very well. And you get an idea of just the overall size and impression of the animal, what they look like generally, just like you, you learn to recognize people to an extent. That's not to say we don't always get it wrong, particularly since we don't share the exact same view that you see through your, through the camera. But I suspect it's the Inkuhumas. Um, the only thing that's made me doubtful is the size of one of those tracks, or both of those tracks, which are quite small. The Inkuhumas have incredibly large feet, but I don't know if it's just because of the dew in the sand and the way that the tracks have fallen. Maybe they just look smaller to me than normal. I'm not entirely sure. I was about to draw your attention to that Oriole, but it flew off as I thought about it. Another one chirping away, whistling away, but I can't see exactly where it is.
somebody's feeling particularly sleepy this morning, I'm sure you're all as interested as I am to work out which lionesses we have here. But we'll leave with, we'll stay with our view that we have for now. Particularly since I think it's going to take a couple of Austin Power style 20 point turns to loop around them. I'm going to take some serious navigating skill. Black-headed Oriole. I do want to reposition and it's just going to take me a few moments. I'd prefer to do that whilst not on air. So let's head over to Brent for now and I will catch up with you very shortly. So we've left those lions and they're not moving at all and there's quite a lot of other vehicles that want to go have a look and we were lucky enough to have them all to ourselves for quite a while early in the morning. So I've just got a report of a male leopard, an unrelaxed male leopard that was a brief, brief glimpse was seen. So I'm slowly making my way into that area to see if we can possibly find him. It seems like the cats are out to play in this glorious morning light on this sunrise safari. Ephraim, Ephraim. Ephraim, if I want to look for that one on Ingwe, where's the best place to check? Where was the last visual you had? Yeah, keep coming to the car and see them right here. We can drove. I will show you the way that you will come back. Okay, Kobe, thanks very much. So, Ephraim just saw him, and there's apparently a drag mark around, so he might have a kill. So, we, what we might do is try to establish where the kill is. If it's an unrelaxed leopard, we actually will leave him alone. We'll try to get a view of him, but we won't put too much pressure, go too close. So, we obviously want him to become a relaxed leopard, and the best way to do that is at night. Leopards are far more comfortable at night. So if he has got a kill and it's up in a tree, uh, we'll start viewing at night from a bit of a bigger distance. And one must remember, Tingana was an unrelaxed male at one stage. He used to run away from cars, and now look at him. He lies right next to us. Another new viewer, so big welcome to Steve on Saf welcome to the Safari Live family. Uh, Steve says, I'm new here, so I'm not sure, is Tingana a type of leopard or is it his name? Tingana is his name, it means the shy one. So when he first started being seen, he came from a western area where there's not a lot of vehicles, and he was very skittish around the cars, like this leopard we're about to go look for right now. So uh, we will try with this new leopard to try slowly habituate him to being calm around a car. So it's quite an interesting time and, and one of my favorite things is to habituate uh, unrelaxed animals to the vehicles. And you need quite a bit of patience and you drive quite carefully and slowly. You keep a lot more distance than you would normally, but it is quite exciting and it's always exhilarating to see a new big cat. So there's been two unrelaxed male leopards seen in, in the last while. Uh, one is a very big male, uh, you, they call Kajima, and the other is a young male. So I'm not sure which this is. I'm about to meet up with Ephraim. We're gonna have a little meeting and discuss where the best way to look for this leopard is. While we do that, let's go have a look at those gorgeous lionesses with Jamie. have managed to reposition and as we did the second lioness just got up she's eating grass and trees so it's maybe with a bit of an unsettled stomach she's also got a fresh injury 
on her left side that looks very much like a bite wound. I mentioned that she's constantly looking up. She is a little bit nervous in her own way. Hello, girl. Who have we got here? This is the Inkuhumas. I'm almost certain that this is the lioness, the older lioness. I'm not sure who the individual at the back is. If you guys could just confirm that for me, I'm relatively certain. Fairly empty bellies. Oh, they are relatively hungry. I wonder if they were not responsible for the loss of Tingana's kill and where the rest of the pride actually is. Beautiful in this morning light. I don't think they're going to stay here either. I still feel as though they're going to keep moving while it's cool enough for them to be able to do so. Marsha was wondering, we had to track these lioness to find them, but very often we manage to find lioness by following alarm calls or lions or any other big predator. Marsha was wondering, would, any, would there be any animals to alert us to their presence at night? And Marsha less so than during the day. But that being said, especially on full moon nights, the monkeys will wake up and alarm call at them. The Things like dukops and thick knees, or as they're now known, thick knees, will alarm call. I just heard a zebra, so did she. That yip yip sound of zebra coming into conflict with each other. So, Marsha, thick knees might alarm call. Franklin might alarm call if they are disturbed, but for the most part, they tend to be quite happily fast asleep at night. Here the zebra go again. Just want to sit and listen for a moment, so does she. Investigating, or is that grass just a little bit too interesting? The sound that I heard before it stopped was zebra yipping at each other, and it sounded, it didn't sound like alarm calls, it sounded like they were coming into whether it might have been a male or a female that was being bitten by another member of the herd. It sounded like an internal dispute. She heard it as well. But difficult to hear anything over the current cacophony that the birds of Juma are making this morning. They are singing away their dawn chorus. Most prominent is the call of the Cape Turtle Dove. There's also the black-headed oriole whistling away. A whole wide range of robins, cisticulars, drongos calling as well. And the birds are loving this morning, as am I. It doesn't get better than starting off your day with lionesses illuminated in the morning light. Good 
you know, it's not just us that get annoyed by the biting flies out here. Let's see if we can't see the injury on this lioness as she walks towards us. It's not huge. She's walking stiffly. So something has happened. to try and stay with them it is going to be very tricky from our perspective i'm going to try and stay on this game path that i can see hopefully we should be able to keep up with them i didn't think they were going to stick around i just let taxon go ahead of me his guests haven't had a very good view yet this morning so I'm going to let them go ahead. I don't think that they're going to be able to, in their long vehicles, keep up as well as we will. But it would be very convenient if you just went ahead of me and cleared the way. They're going. Stopped there. And just as an interesting aside, my brakes have just gone just as a random little fact of information. Off they go. Well, this will just make the whole experience far more interesting. I wonder when that happened. I can't see any brake fluid pouring out, but there's definitely no, no resistance when I put my foot down on the brake pedal. That's okay. When I first started working as a safari guide, the vehicle I drove was completely without brakes. That's how I learned to drive off-road and whilst taking people on a game drive. So it's just like old times. Whoopsie. We'll just reevaluate, see if I've still got the skills I used to have. dynamics between or the dynamics within our lion prides that occurred as the Birmingham boy takeover happened and we have a question about whether or not after the Birmingham boys killed the sticks females cubs whether or not they would ever eat those cubs or what would occur from there and I'm going to answer you in one moment so Century Otter, that was a question from you. The answer is, it very much depends on how the male's feeling at the time. Yeah, they've li they're lying down again. Awesome. Okay, everybody watch your heads. We're going to go slalom race around the silver cluster leaves as we answer. So sometimes male lions do eat the cubs that they've killed, sometimes they don't. With the Birmingham boys, the one actually took one of the cubs and played with it a little bit, cuddled it a little bit, but never, as far as we knew, actually finished it off and ate it. So it does just depend on the lion, but there are lots of, or there are recorded cases of male lions eating the cubs that they have killed. It just depends on, it's, it's more unusual, let's put it this way, it's more unusual for them to have eaten them. 
and it is not, but the Mapuhos were known to do that. The Birmingham boys did eat some of the lioness that they killed. Not completely, but they did have what I could only describe as sort of a, a snack bite. So it does occur. I need to make space for Aubrey as well in here, but let's just have this nice view for now, especially since I can't quite stop the car. Oops. All right. I'm just going to make space for Aubrey, so we've got to go under one more tree. And Taxon, since he also wants to be in the sighting. Let's just go forward a little bit. Everybody watch your heads again. So for now, we'll stay with the view of the lioness on the right. Let's just see what these two decide to do with the rest of their morning. Now, generally, when predators kill other predators, and that can be a predator of the same species or it can be a predator of different species, in the general pattern is that they are not going to eat them. It's more killing them for uh, reducing the competition, or in the case of the Birmingham boys, it's killing them in order to... Sorry, hold on one second. I just need to listen to the Game Drive channel. There's a couple of people that want to come and join us. sighting under control. So yes, generally predators don't eat other predators. The Birmingham boys killed the cubs not for food, but in order to bring the sticks or the, to bring the sticks lionesses back into estrus as quickly as possible so that they could mate with them and pass on their own genetics rather than wasting the time raising another set of lion cubs that were not theirs. Now although it's a terribly brutal process from our perspective. From lion's perspective, it makes a total sense. A male lion has no idea how long their tenure will last over a couple of prides. It could be six months, it could be three years. Most of the time, however, it only lasts for about a generation's worth of cubs, maybe one, maybe two sets of cubs that they will be able to produce before they have the possibility of a younger and fitter lion coming in and taking over. So rather than spend that whole time, and a female will take up to a year and a half, if not longer, before she's ready to mate again, if she has young cubs. So rather than wait for all that time and risk losing control of that area, it makes sense to kill her cubs and bring her back into estrus as fast as possible. Not ideal from a human perspective, but it does make complete sense. And it's one of the ways in which lions have prevented, or lions have evolved to prevent inbreeding because a male lion is not picky. He will mate with his daughters and he will mate with his granddaughters and he will mate with his sister and his mother if the possibility or the, the opportunity prevent, presents itself. That's why you need that constant flux of males coming in and changing things up so that you don't get the generations of inbred lions. It's something that they control very, very well themselves. It's one of the reasons why Junior left was sort of pushed out of the Kahuma Pride. He was getting to the stage where he was showing interest in both his mother and his sisters and his aunts. And if there had been no other males around, the Nkuhumas would have mated with him. <laughs> Peter. The bird that is currently talking louder than I am this, on this bright morning is a Cape turtle dove. 
and it is a sound that you will hear no matter where you are in the low felt and constantly calling at any time of the year at almost any time of the day you will hear a turtle dove the famous description of that call of course is that he is saying work harder work harder work harder or depending on the time of day apparently drink lager so it just depends on how you interpret it also could be saying its name cape turtle it's amazing how as human beings most of us need to associate words or bits of songs with bird calls in order to learn them and i promise you i'm absolutely no exception to that there's also a sterling's wren warbler chirping in the background that very repetitive chirpit 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 and the black-headed oriole is also having a wonderful time Hmm. I wonder which brake line has gone. I still am not entirely convinced that these lionesses have done moving for the day. I think they're going to keep going. They don't look fully restful. Head up and ears out, and as I said, not entirely full either. So, have we definitely confirmed that these are the Uncoomas? I mean, I mean, they're not the sticks. The sticks are far more pregnant than these two. Right, Brent has found a leopard on foot. He's not sure how skittish the leopard actually is. So let's go across as he drives in and find out. So, it's a big male leopard from the tracks, and I followed the drag mark of something he's killed. Now, he ran when he saw me on foot, so we think it's the skittish male. So, you're going to come in with me. So, we might only get a split second visual of him. Uh, if not, I think I found where he, he is keeping, where he's got that kill. But I didn't go any closer on foot. I'd rather take you guys in with me on the vehicle. So we're just going to go very slowly, very quietly, until um, we get in there. And we might get a good visual of him. Now, the other option is, which we'll discuss a little bit, is what we might do is sit very quietly nearby the kill to see if he comes in and gets more relaxed with the vehicle. We won't sit next to the kill, we'll sit probably 50 or 60 meters away, giving him enough space to feel uh, a little bit safe. But this is really exciting. I love seeing new cats. So I'm just gonna have to concentrate quite hard here. So I did find it when I was walking, and you can see this is quite a thick area and everything looks quite similar, I'm pretty sure. I can get us back to where he was. Now, it looks like quite a big kill, maybe an adult impala, uh, maybe a small kudu or something like that. And I didn't push, as I said, didn't push any closer on foot. You know, he bounded away from me, but it, he didn't sound like he ran too far. So I heard him, doo -doo 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 -doo, but then he stopped, which is a good sign. And leopard will often do that. They'll just run a little bit and then lie down and hide. He was just on the other side of this very thick area here. So I'm just going to sneak forward slightly. And with unrelaxed animals like this, you've got to try to keep your movements down to a minimum. I'm pretty 
sure the kills are on there somewhere. I'm just finding find a way to move around. Without making too much noise. Going directly to where the, I think the killers are. I'm taking a slightly wider stance. This way, Dave, so keep a look out over here. jumpy because it looks like a herd of elephants has come through here already as well. So if that kills on the ground, he would have popped it under a thicket very similar to what Tingana did yesterday. Getting some of my mojo back. I think he has moved off. Um, he's probably lying very close to us, just watching us at the moment. So I'm going to go see if I can find the kill. It just gives us a good spot to think about how to reposition or where to wait. So where was I? I was walking just over here and he ran off somewhere in this vicinity. We're looking under the thickets. probably going to have to go for a little walk to find the kill and once I've found the kill we can make a plan on how we're going to go forward with this with this leopard so while I do that let's jump back on with Jamie who's still with those lovely Ngoma ladies well Brent looks for the kill and for the leopard our lionesses have been greatly active I think she twitched an ear once 
while you were gone. So never fear, you haven't missed anything major. Just a ball of large cat curled up in the grass. And I think probably I said that they weren't finished moving. I'm relatively certain that in fact they are. They're probably going to stay here for the rest of the morning. It's already heated up tremendously from our initial chilly start to the morning. So they're probably going to just wait the day out somewhere. And they might move a couple of meters into the block, but beyond that, I think that they're going to remain absolutely here. Question, of course, for it is on everyone's mind is where are the rest of the Nkuhuma lionesses? Are they on Vuyatilla or are they not? Are they further north towards the Manuleti or towards Buffelswick? I don't have an answer to that. It's interesting how mysteriously they have moved in the last few days. There was a period last week sometime where we saw them for the last time. They were looking very, very hungry, very thin. They killed a zebra on Simbabili. We were chased off it by the Minjingalans. And after that, I don't think we saw them. From then, I can't think of a sighting where we saw the Nkuhuma lionesses from that point. This is the first time that we have seen them. They've clearly eaten since then. They've definitely had a meal. Um, but it hasn't been, for these lionesses at least, it either was a little while ago or it hasn't, wasn't a particularly large meal because they're not overly full. As to the injury on the one lioness, it could have been either from a hunt or from another lion. I have not much idea as to exactly how old our Kuhuma lionesses are. The one that we were looking at, the one that we had the best view of earlier, is definitely an older lioness. Her teeth are starting to yellow and to wear down. Her nose is completely black, although that's not 100% reliable at all times. But Curtis was wondering if there are different life expectancies between the males and the females. In lions, in the wild, yes, absolutely. Males have a far shorter life expectancy. Cheers, Tax. Bye, fun. Bye, guys. Lion, may, oh, somebody's up. Somebody's doing something. She's gonna go and cuddle. Oh, no, she's going. I thought she was gonna go in for a head rub there. She's just moving down to a different patch of shade. Well, at least they both put themselves in our view now. But yes, the, the, sorry, distraction again. I'm just listening to Ephraim's update about leopard tracks. I'll find out from him. He's on his way here anyway. It sounds as though he saw leopard tracks around Gallego shortcut, which could well be Tingana. Of course, we still haven't worked out exactly where Tingana went yesterday. Right, sorry, Curtis. Um, so males have a far shorter life expectancy. It averages around 10, maybe a little bit longer depending on the area. It will differ from environment to environment and from ecosystem to ecosystem. But usually it is around 10 years old on average. The female is slightly older, so between 12, 13, even up to 16. I have known lionesses that have lived up to between 14 and 16 years old generally where they reach the end of their lifespan. They don't live as long as leopards do, but it makes sense in most of the mammal species. Oh, having a good sniff of the morning air. In most mammal species, the females have a longer life expectancy than the males. It's the same with human beings on average. Generally, women live longer than men. It's a combination. You can interpret that as you will. In wildlife, in African wildlife, a lot of that is due to fighting over mating possibilities, as well as a general overall resilience in terms of health from the females. I don't understand that the woman drives the men to the grave. <laughs> VM. VM says it's because women drive men to an early grave. <laughs> I'm not sure about that in lions, though. <laughs> the poor lionesses hunt for the males, they feed the males. Not always, though, of course. Bear in mind, I'm just 
I'm listing stereotypes here. That is. Watch them. They bite them. They take them away. <laughs> says they get swatted, bitten, and chased away at times. Um, so we could continue the battle of the sexes for long into the morning. <laughs> I'm going to try drag us down that route. <laughs> Although that is highly entertaining. Yes, girl. Yes, girl. I'm on your side. Well, here we go. We're going down a different route. Katrina saying that personally she thinks that the lionesses are more regal and attractive than the males. Um, I'm not sure. That's a difficult one. A fully grown male lion in the midst of a full roar with a nice clean mane is always a spectacular sighting. But Katrina, I understand where you're coming from. There's certainly look. Okay, we go, we were running down the the sort of the road of a stereotype. But there is, the lionesses are a lot more lithe. They're about 100 to 200, 100 kilograms, 200 pounds lighter than the males. And they don't have that bulky mane, which, let's face it, looks very pretty, but is a rather stupid thing to have to carry around on your head all day in a place that is 40 degrees in summer. Um, and then, of course, it's, it's nice for displaying to the females, and it's, it's lovely to protect your neck against the bite of a male lion. But other than that, a completely impractical sort of thing that they have wrapped around their heads, like wearing a headscarf. I think it makes a nice pillow. Summer. Might make a nice pillow, though. Very valid argument. Fium says it might make a nice pillow. In fact, it probably does. And as a result, male lions are more comfortable when they sleep than females. <laughs> that being said, the females can often are seen as the, the hunters of the lion world because they can actually afford to put more energy into hunting. They don't overheat as quickly. They are smaller, lighter, more agile. And as a result, they have become, in inverted commas, the main providers. Ha, the main providers. <laughs> that was unintentional and terribly lame. Um, that being said, the male lions also exert a tremendous amount of energy. They are more than capable of hunting for themselves. And in fact, the Birmingham boys have showed that time and time again, they are very effective buffalo hunters. They are also bigger, stronger, and a pride that has male lions traveling with it will aim for larger prey, the giraffe, the large male buffalo, even Junior um, at the young age that he was when we sort of last saw him was participating very actively and playing a crucial ro role in the hunts. That and the fact that the male lions have enormous territories to patrol and if they don't patrol them they risk a male lion another male lion coming in potentially killing their cubs or killing the females in an unnecessary show of aggression so they do have a very important job to do it is just different approaches for the different ways that animals are had or are evolved to or the way in which they're evolved to function goodness that sentence would not really come out of my mouth all that easily. So, yes, male lions have a different approach to the way that they work or the way that they do different things. Uh, I'm going to reposition at some point, but Sarah in Ohio has said and confirmed and Sarah very carefully follows the different lionesses and in particular the Uncahuma pride. And so I know Sarah did a big project, I think it was last year for school, on the lionesses. So Sarah's confirmed it is the Inkahumas. I thought it was. We just have to, you know what, it's important never to take something for granted. I've been told an individual animal's identity before by another guide and got there and found a completely different animal just because an assumption is made about the area that they're in. So thank you, Sarah. Perfect. Now we know for certain, now we are happy and comfortable with the conclusion that we have drawn. Should we see if we can't find a nicer spot now that we're the only people here? Good point. Very, very, very good point from Megan. Let's try that again. Okay, Wendy. It's all right. I'm sorry about your breaks. Uh, Megan was wondering, I said that lionesses are uh, considerably lighter than the male lions, but I didn't actually 
explain what they weigh. That's a very valid point from Megan. I think this is probably going to be our best possible... Oh, sorry. Forgot I couldn't stop. How's that from your perspective, Ian? That's okay. I think it might be as, as good as we're going to get for now. Especially because Ephraim wants to come and join us. So, Megan, valid point. I didn't tell you exactly what the weight was. In, in rough, in kilogram terms, they are about 140-odd kilograms. Between 110 and 150. These are lionesses that are on the larger scale in terms of weight. I would put, if I had to guess, at the weight of the largest lioness here, I would say she's about 140-odd kilograms. That equates to close to 300 pounds in weight. So a range between just under 300 pounds to just over 300 pounds. With male lions, a big male lion, about 220 to 240 kilograms. I think the largest ever seen was 250 something in this area. I have to try and remember exactly. So that equates to 500 odd pounds just under 500 to just over to just over 500 pounds my apologies my pound conversion is not always what it should be but i do sort of roughly times by 2.2 i'm just checking something for you i want to check what the largest male lion is that's ever been found okay so the largest female was 175 kilograms, but that was not here, that was in Itosha. And that was at the time of this book's publication, which was in 2012. What's that? 175 for the largest female, times by 2.2, is 360 odd, 350 to 360 pounds. The largest male ever recorded was also from Itosha at 260. The heaviest male from Kruger, so I've slightly underestimated the heaviest male from this area, 225. So let's say the Birmingham boys are a bit smaller. Let's say the Matimba males weighed 220 times by 2.2, close to 500 pounds. 470 pounds, give or take a bit. My mental maths first thing in the morning, timesing by 2.2. You'll have to adjust the figures as you see fit, but you get the rough idea. It's a very valid point, Megan, sorry. I gave you the difference between the two, but providing you with an actual sense of scale would have been quite useful as well. So they are big animals. They are very big, incredibly powerful animals. And you only realize how big they are when you see them on foot. <laughs> Christy has called them very personable. <laughs> Him? Are you personable? I think you're quite personable. I think you're hilarious. Yeah, I think pretty personable. <laughs> Fim and I will continue our debate about females versus males at some point later after the drive. I think I would also scratch and swat somebody that tried to steal the food that I hunted down, but you never know. <laughs> Doesn't really work out for them that well. Good morning, Sibu Sisu, the black mama who lives in Hammond's Kral. It's great to have you with us on the show once again. Sibu Sisu, you missed out on our last herbal sighting. It was with Viam, and it was three nights ago, four nights ago, that we had a serval sighting. But Sibu Sisu's question is actually, lions and leopards get habituated to vehicles relatively easily. Why don't servals? Why doesn't something like a serval? When was the last time we saw a serval? Surprisingly, that serval sighting, that serval was actually considerably more relaxed than it would have been during the daytime. If we were to put the same amount of effort that was put into habituating the big cats as was done many, many years ago at the start or the formation of these great game reserves, then we would have serval equally as relaxed. Serval actually habituates people really easily. Whether or not they habituate to vehicles easily, as far as I know, hasn't been something that's been tried all that often. But these lions have been perfectly habituated to vehicles because they have grown up. You can guarantee 
no matter how old they are, they will have grown up with vehicles watching them from, the very from their very birth right up until now. And they did go through a stage where they were a bit more skittish than usual, and I think that was just because they'd actually moved into an area where they weren't seeing vehicles all that often before they came back to us. Whether or not that was in the Kruger itself or further north towards Manuleti, we're never quite sure. At the time that these great game reserves were started, habituating the big cats was one of the big projects, and it is absolutely essential to their survival as a species, particularly in a country like South Africa, where close to, where tourism is one of our biggest revenues. Because the animals are habituated, the tourists come to see them, they pay money that therefore goes towards the protection of these animals as a whole. So at the time, and this would have been anywhere from the 50s to the 70s, even into the 80s, depending on which part of South Africa you are from, what the, the guys would have been doing, they would have been taking a dead impala or a dead springbok, depending on where you are in South Africa, some kind of prey animal, putting it in a tree and sitting with the vehicle at 200 meters, then 150 meters, then 100 meters, and then leaving the vehicle with the radio on. And this can take weeks and weeks and months of work to habituate. And you start with a female, because when that female is habituated and she has cubs, then her cubs grow up knowing that vehicles are a good thing. So this, this process didn't happen overnight. We just happen to be reaping the benefits of it now. Could we do the same thing with servals? A bit more difficult because, you know, you can't really, you can't put a bait out for a serval because it'll probably disappear to a leopard or a, to a lion. It's easier to do with apex predators because you don't risk harming them or interfering them in, with them in the same way. Are there other ways that servals could be habituated? Yes. But also bear in mind that servals are a lot fewer in number than something like a leopard or a lion in this area. I'm not, I couldn't give you an exact number. I don't think there's anyone who can give you an exact number in this area without extensive study. But they are less common. And so we see them less frequently. So we have less opportunity to habituate them. I still, I mean, that, that circle that we saw on Zoe's road the other night was relatively relaxed. And it's so nice that we've got to the point that we've privileged enough to be able to sit with the lionesses like this and for them to basically completely ignore our presence. I mean, she's lifted her head now, but she's not looking at us at all. She's lifting her head because she heard something in the bush. And whatever it is, she's, oh, I was about to say, she's not all that interested. I think she's just going to put her head back down and go to sleep. I mean, we've got a really clear example of how it's not easy to habituate a leopard or a lion overnight. We've seen Gajima. Gajima has been seen for the last six or seven months on odd occasions, or at least since I started working here. There were reports of him mating with Karula on Buffelshook. So this male leopard has been around the area for at least or close to, coming up close to a year. And there's plenty of vehicles that are moving around him. He's probably watched us drive past more times than I can count. But he has not become used to the vehicles overnight, and he's not going to. It will take us considerable time and patience to get him to the point where we will be able to view him. And it might be that whilst we can view Tingana from 50 meters away quite happily, and he will ignore us, and that he'll walk right past the car, it might be that with that particular leopard, he continues to need a bit more personal space or has a larger comfort zone with a vehicle. It remains to be seen exactly. Tingana apparently was relatively skittish when he first arrived. He was an Ottawa leopard, if I'm not mistaken. So from the far, far west of here, not used to vehicles at all. And it did take him a considerable period of time to become relaxed or as relaxed as he has reached at this point that he will walk past and sort of almost brush the car with his tail, which is something that we're exceptionally privileged and perhaps sometimes we take for granted while we're out here. We don't realize just how lucky we are. In Kahumas, interestingly enough, just talking about the ways that animals have been habituated, not habituated, habituated is 
perhaps in this respect the wrong word, but I've got used to being tracked. When I first started work, working here, if you were tracking the Nkuhumas, nine times out of ten you would see their bottoms disappearing into the bushes, never to see them again. When you went back to get the vehicle, they were gone. Now, at 100 meters, at 50 meters, you can actually watch them. They will stand and watch you. They don't get scared, they don't run away. They just keep an eye on you. And you move, and then immediately you can move backwards out of their space and go and fetch the vehicle and enjoy a sighting like this. It's nice to see that they've relaxed far more to people on foot. Maybe because Junior's gone, that's one of the theories that's been put forward. Uh, Kathy in Washington, while we watch our... Let me just let Frank and finish its sentence. Cool. Right, we're finished there. Kathy, sorry, you were wondering if, while we watch the sleeping lioness, if lionesses prefer a more closed environment to male lions, if male lions would prefer to sleep out in the open. You might find that, Kathy, there's a slight skew in favor of females favoring slightly more closed habitats. That being said, I've seen the Nkuhumas sleeping right out in the open before with no problems at all. It's far more a shade and temperature driven choice that they make. It's when females have cubs or are coming close to having cubs that perhaps you'll see them moving more and more into thick vegetation where they can hide their cubs. Nkumas have spent a lot of time in the drainage line system around Galago Pan. I don't think that's because they are females. I think that is just because they enjoy it there. But that will also, Kathy, the other th thing that will factor in rather than necessarily just gender is the number of lions that you have. So the more lions they, that are within the pride, the more comfortable they will feel. So the Nkumas, when they do lie out in the open, it's usually with all five of them. It just depends on the number. But yes, there might be a slight skew in favour of the females being in closed habitats. They are slightly more under threat, but for the most part, there's not much that's going to come and trouble a couple of lionesses sleeping out in the open. Now, speaking of different predators, let's find out how Brent's search has been going. So, we did find that leopard again on foot. He actually came charging past Dave when he spotted me walking. We haven't been able to find the carcass just yet. So what we're going to do is I'm going to leave that area. He's very, very not relaxed. And uh, there's a lot of these guys around. And I'm probably going to come back with Jamie after game drive. And we'll go for another walk in that area and follow those drag marks all the way. But unfortunately, too many Ellie's around. So what I think has happened is that he was dragging that, I presume, an impala or small kudu just from the size of the drag mark. And I think the elephants chased him. So he's, he's dropped that carcass somewhere. And we're not exactly 100% sure where yet. And I think it's going to take a, a quite a lot of walking very carefully uh, to find where it is because the Ellie tracks have also obliterated quite a bit of the drag mark. And uh, also, he's had two f scares this morning. He's seen me twice, so give him some time to relax. And hopefully, we'll be able to find him for the sunset safari. So I'm pr very confident he's got food there. So after the first time, um, he spotted me and ran off, and we went back to fetch the vehicle. Um, I went and got out of the vehicle for the second time. And while I was walking a little bit to the north of it, the car. He ran probably seven or eight meters past the car, next to Dave. Right next to, right next to Dave, and I, you can actually hear him when the leopard runs fast. This doo -doo 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 -doo. And all of a sudden, I just heard Dave's <whistles> whistle, and uh, I assumed that the leopard had passed quite close to him when I heard him start whistling. Uh, 
Look at that nice big elephant cow. And a really lovely comment from Brian. Brian says he doesn't interact frequently, but been watching Safari Live for the last six months with his kids. And he just wanted to say, really enjoying it. And thanks a lot, guys. Good job. Well, thank you, Brian. And hopefully you keep watching. And wonderful that you're sharing it with your children. Uh, they are the future, the next generation of conservationists in the making. There we go. There's a young one. I'm just going to move forward. I think she might pop out onto the road next to us. Definitely, I've seen this cow before with the one tusk. She's a very big individual. Probably the matriarch or leader of the herd. You see, as she starts moving, the rest of the herd start moving with her, which does lead me to think that she's probably the leader of this herd. She is quite old, I guess, over 40 years old. So awesome to be able to spend so much time with Ellie's and there's been a lot of them around at the moment which has been great. feeding towards us. And a big lady. Oh, and here we go, nice little boy coming. If you hear a bunch of beeps, it's just us turning on the VR, the virtual reality rig. I've uh, got one cam down unfortunately, so don't worry about what I just said. So there we go, you can see, there we go, we've got a young bull right next to us, and you can see how, oh, where's my finger, rounded his head compared to the females, which is very angular, which he turns. There we go, look at them. As this female swings her ears, just have a look at that mass of uh, blood vessels and veins behind her ears. It's an incredibly complex network there for such a thin little piece of skin. Now, what keeps their ears quite rigid is cartilage. And you can see, especially on the older ones at the top of the ear, that cartilage starts getting a little bit old and loses some of its rigidity and that's where you get that fold over the back of the ears and folds slightly in the younger ones as you can see there but not nearly as prominent as in the the older ones that's almost certainly her calf when she went past us a bit closer you could actually see suckle marks around her teeth Little dust bath. Oh, 
Well, Cofton's got an interesting question. Cofton would like to know, how would I get on if I had to do one of these drives in Australia? And uh, was it just the African animals I'm an expert in? Well, I would have to say I'd probably have to do quite a lot of reading. And uh, I do know a bit about Australian mammals, but not nearly as much about the African variety. Although I think I'd be okay with the crocodiles. Know lots about crocodiles, saltwater and, and Nile. Let's just go a little bit further forward. And I think these Ellie's are about to disappear into the thick bush, and we're not going to crash after them. We'll just keep going. I uh, see what else we can find. They are moving onto Juma, but they are moving into this very thick bush. Also, it's very close to where that unrelaxed male leopard is, so I want him to have lots of time to relax during the next hour or so before I go out to see if I can find him after drive or at least find where his kill is so we can have a possibility of seeing him on the sunset safari. There we go. Goodbye, big grey bottom. And she moves into the thicket. We're going to move off and we might as well go see if we can get to find out where Tingana went. So there's another male leopard to look for, so we're going to head towards the last tracks that I've seen of Tingana, see if we have any luck. Now, wouldn't be that, that be spectacular? Three male, or three, no, two male leopards in a morning. Not something we've had for a while. So while we move off, let's go jump back on with Jamie. Hopefully two male leopards one morning. We've had male lions and female lions on the sunrise safari, one of whom was just giving herself a good chest scratch. Other than that, not too much movement from our ladies. I think that the female lying with her head in the sun is probably going to get up at some point to reposition. That doesn't look terribly comfortable. Also, just trying to help somebody into the sighting as well. Sorry, bear with me one second. I did copy Lee. Okay, copy that. Perfect. Ah. Oh. <laughs> The thing about the two lion sightings going on this morning, the Birmingham boys are on a main road, as they were the other morning. So there's lots and lots of vehicles that can go and see them and want to go and see them. Uh, the, the, the different people have to weigh up, do they want to wait in line or do they want to come straight to my sighting? The difficulty with our sighting, of course, first of all is finding us at this point, which is why I'm listening carefully to the Game Drive channel but also managing to find their way through something of a thick block. It's easier for us. We are much shorter in terms of our vehicle size. Even without brakes, it's a little bit easier for us. We have to try and figure out exactly at which point the brakes decided to go and which vehicle is, which, which tire has, oh, hold well on. Just listening to this update now. Hey girl, you sun shining in your eyes there. Uh, copy that, Lee. I assume you're going to make your way to that sighting. No problem, enjoy. Okay, so that's sorted out. We just, one of the vehicles deciding whether or not they wanted to go down to the sighting in the south or to our sighting here. As I said, it's a bit of a balancing act deciding which particular way they wanted to go. But that's all sorted out. Brent's managed to get hold of the different vehicles that are in charge of the Birmingham boy sighting, and she'll be able to go into that sighting now. She might just have to wait a little bit longer than she would with us. Oh, 
Ryan, who is watching in Idaho. What's up, girl? What did you hear? I, don't, I think she's just a little bit on alert, but she's given us a perfect position to look at what Ryan has noticed on the back of her ears. Ooh. Ooh, what, what's got your attention, girl? So you see that slight, slight shift in body language? The second female now also up and alert. They're still just listening, determining what that sound is. But it gives us a perfect moment to look at what Ryan mentioned about the dark spots on the backs of the ears. Now, Ryan's been joining us for the last few drives, watching from Idaho. And Ryan, they're not part of camouflage, but they are specifically there for you to notice. And not really for us to notice as people, but for lions to notice as lions. The ears play a tremendously important role in the visual communication between different lions, as well as communication between mothers and their cubs. So a lot of research has been done into the way in which lionesses coordinate a hunt, or lions coordinate a hunt, they always seem to know exactly where to go. But there's theories now that a lot of that is visually communicated through movements by th of the ears and the tails. Either way, the most important body parts for visual communication, the ears, the tail, and the face, and the nose, are, and the lips, are highlighted in black. Black is a color that shows up very distinctly and very clearly in the bush. So it's to highlight the different signals that the lions are sending to each other. That might be, I'm aggressive, so maybe ears up. I'm nervous and I feel threatened, ears back and down. Lips curled up and snarling, showing the teeth. Tail thrashing can also be a sign of aggression. Uh, there's different messages highlighted by different body language cues. And the black just serves to emphasize them. There's also an argument, particularly with the black at the back of a lion's, or on the tip of a lion's tail, that the same could be said for the ears, that it is a way of helping the cubs to follow the mothers at a young age, because their eyesight, their sense is not as well developed as they are in the adults. So having a color that stands out is a little bit more helpful, particularly on a normal summer, in a normal summer season when the grass is nice and thick and tall. What's the matter, girl? What are you hearing? Let's just listen for a second, see if I can't hear what's happening. The other lioness not paying too much attention to her. Look how scruffy the back of the neck of that lioness is. That might have been, she might have been mating recently. So from the male grabbing the back of her neck. Or it could be from ticks that one of the other lionesses has licked off her and dislodged from the back of her neck. I'm just going to take my earpiece out for one second. I just want to listen. I can hear something, but I can't work out what I can hear. I think it might still be those elephants moving in the distance. She has relaxed again, though. No, nope, she's relaxing again. See how the ears drooped ever so slightly? The head no longer in the fully upright position suggests that she is relaxing once again. And I think that she is going to spend, or I think that they are going to spend the rest of the day in this vicinity. It's now got to the point where it's a little bit too hot for them to be moving about. That being said, lions do strange things. It was that situation where the Inkahumas were watching a herd of buffalo and I said to the viewers that nothing was going to happen because it had got too hot and the buffalo promptly wandered straight into the lionesses and the lionesses managed to catch one. So 
It depends. Something could wander through here and chase them. The elephants, for example, would and could chase these lionesses away. Or they could find something that they want to hunt. Just depends on how the day goes. I don't think they're going to move too far, though. I just would love, I wish, sometimes, I know it's, it's part of the mystery and it's part of the fun, but sometimes I wish I could just engage some kind of psychic power to know exactly where the rest of the pride was, just out of curiosity. But then that would be, take away half the fun, I guess, of reading the different signs and following and getting, piecing together different pieces of the story. Now, I... <clears throat> I don't think that they're going to be up to too much, so I think that we could probably leave them for the last few moments of the safari. How do you all feel? Do you want to stay or would you like to leave? I'll leave it up to you. You can send that through to questions at wildearth.tv or hashtag safari live. majority will rule in terms of our decision as to whether or not we stay or whether we go and look for other things. But while we do, while we are here, we haven't had the best view of these lionesses, but we've spoken a lot about the Inkahumas versus the sticks. The sticks being highly pregnant, heavily pregnant, not highly pregnant. You can't be highly pregnant, I don't think. They are heavily pregnant. The Inkahumas, if they are pregnant, are very early stages of pregnancy. They're not showing any signs of the swollen nipples. The one female in this pride, and it's the one that is here, has slightly more prominent nipples than the others, but I think that is just the way, that's just a physiological appearance. I don't think it's a sign of pregnancy. But Aqua was wondering specifically on that subject, could I describe suckle marks, the duration, the appearance, etc.? Let's start with the stages of pregnancy and work our way through there. So let's expand a little bit on that question. Initially, signs of pregnancy, distended nipples that become much darker and more prominent the further along in the pregnancy the lioness goes towards the last sort of month to the last two weeks of her gestation period that will become very clear and she'll start carrying a lot of weight not like a full belly but more towards the back her back legs and that will be there regardless of exactly how much food she's eaten not always that easy to see when you've got a lioness with a belly full of buffalo from there, just before she gives birth, a lot of lionesses get a waxy buildup around the nipple itself, ready to start protecting it. And they actually, it's dried milk. They've started lactating before they've had their cubs. Once they do have their cubs, the suckle marks become really very clear. And what you're looking for is a ring, probably in lionesses, I would guess, that sticks out maybe about an inch, maybe a bit less away from the nipple, so two inches in diameter. And it looks like flattened wet fur. And because the milk dries and becomes quite crusty, it is quite clearly visible on their fur. As long as you get a good view of their belly, you'll be able to see exactly what that looks like. And little lion cubs will suckle for a couple of months, they are usually fully weaned by about six months old. But again, that depends on the lioness concerned. And I've seen older cubs, cubs older than six months old, suckling of females. Uh, just, it does very much depend on the lioness themselves and what kind of prey they are managing to get. You might find even that the drought plays a role in terms of when the Yes, it is six months. Sorry, I was checking at the same time. It's definitely six months. Depends on how much access to food the lionesses have and how long they are capable of lactating for. <laughs> I think it's time for us. Apparently, most of you are quite happy for us to move on. Majority rules in our democracy of the safari. And so we shall. James would like us to go and find some wild dogs. We'll see how we go. We'll go see if we can't find some wild dogs. I also want to see if we can't find Tingana at some point. I still want to follow up on where he's gone. I want to know the final piece to that particular puzzle. So last look at the Inkahumas. We should be with them again this afternoon for the sunset safari. And while, oh, big yawn. 
Thomas, let's just hold on one moment. She might get up. Don't think so, though. I think sometimes a yawn is just a yawn. She, if she does get up, it might just be to move further into the shade. That's a pre-snooze yawn. It's a pre-snooze yawn. I agree, Liam. I think it's a pre-snooze yawn. I think it's just the sun is currently shining in my face, so I'm awake, but I want to be asleep. And I might move further into the shade kind of yawn before going back to sleep. But yes, I do want to follow up on Tingana, see if we can't figure that part of the mystery out after the Birmingham boys nicked his kill. So while we head out of this very thick block, I'm going to send you back over to Brent while we do that. So exciting kitty cats all about this morning. So my plan is once we're finished with the sunrise safari, I think Jamie and I are going to go for a walk and uh, see if we can find where that very unrelaxed male leopard has stashed his kill. So as I was saying, I think he got chased by the elephants and he's just dumped it there somewhere. And he keeps trying to come back and then he happened to bump into me. So I want to give him some space, give him a chance to get to his kill, maybe move it into an area he feels more secure. And then we're going to walk in there and see if we can find the kill. And hopefully he hoists it. And that means we can see if we can find him on the sunset safari. Of course, this won't be a leopard sighting like you guys are used to, because he will have to stay quite far away. So it might not be the best sighting, but I know most of you out there will be as excited as me to get a really decent visual of a new big cat. We have had a couple of visuals. Now, there's been a little bit of confusion. So when I had my friends staying at Juma and I was guiding them, uh, we saw, I'm pretty sure, this male leopard we're looking for today. And he's very big, he's a full adult. And then I think with Scott, just before he left, um, an unrelaxed young male leopard was seen. So I think there are two unrelaxed male leopards that have been seen in the last couple of months. But uh, this guy I've seen before, uh, once with a couple, a long time ago at Buffelsook Dam, and then the second time when I was with my friends at Buffelsook Dam, and now a third time today. So he is getting better slowly, and uh, hopefully with a little bit of, a little bit more hard work, he'll become a nice relaxed male we can view easily. So I know Jamie's much closer to the area of the last tracks of Tingana, and I've checked with the guys in the east. There's been no sign of Karula at that side. So I've made my way to the area around the treehouse waterhole and to see if we maybe possibly can find any tracks. And if not, then we might meander back down to those big Birmingham boys because uh, there's a strong possibility they are going to cross our boundary. So have one last look before they disappear. Morning, Aaron, and Aaron's from the land of the long white cloud, though I'm not very impressed with at the moment since the Crusaders beat my rugby team this weekend, the Sharks. Uh, still haven't got myself around to watch the highlights, but uh, Aaron is wondering, once we get the, the Cheetah Plains, Travis, are we going to see new lions and leopards? The lions, no, uh, we're going to see the same lions, uh, just we'll have more of their territory, but we probably see more of the Sticks girls. They, they tend to spend quite a bit of time down there. And the Birmingham boys. So we'll see, we should see the same lions. Uh, from leopards, we will see a few different leopards. Uh, Tandi has a bit of territory there. In, in Tanyanin, another female leopard's also got territory there. And uh, Shivambalan, a male leopard, is coming in from uh, the Kruger side. And he's actually one of Karula's offspring. So he's down there. And then occasionally other young male leopards, Quarantine and, and Kunyuma are seen there quite regularly. So not new, but we haven't seen them in an exceedingly long time. But I think probably one of the biggest bonuses, apart from all the other uh, leopards we might have the chance of finding, is that the fact that the cheetah do move through that area quite regularly. So there's some nice open plains, uh, hence the name Cheetah Plains. So it'll be really wonderful to actually see some cheetah for a bit. They cross through there about once a week. 
and very regular those male cheetah on their patrols. As you can see, this hot weather has brought on an absolute, I'm surrounded by biting flies at the moment, doing my best not to attack them. Like um, Tingana uh, last night, at least I'm not trying to bite them as they're around me. But I just need to jump on the game drive radio for a second. Doug, Doug. Laz, Laz. Laz, uh, can you confirm uh, what the lineup is for those Birmingham's? Kobe, thanks very much. There we go. Let's go have a look at those Birmingham's because there is a very strong chance they might do a disappearing act. And they tend to walk through there to this very spot is where we had them a few mornings ago with Jamie. And then they duck off to the south to go patrol the southern boundary. Now, the reason I think they're spending a bit more time on Juma and in this, this general area is that the Salati males are not too far away in Buffalo's Hook and they're being very vocal. So these guys are vocalizing back. So while those Salati males are posing a threat to the north, it's likely the Birminghams are going to spend a bit more time uh, in, in our area. And that all depends, of course, unless the males from Malamala start calling in the south, then they'll run down there to start shouting that side. So it is a, a big job being a male lion, keeping, keeping other male lions out. Here we go, just gonna bypass here. Hi, Umfo. Good evening, sir, bud. Nice to see you. That's Hello, cool. everyone. That's Hi. cool. Cool. Enjoy, Laz. Thank Bye, you. guys. Bye. There you go, that's Lazarus. And don't worry, he's not back from the dead. He's just back from Sibambini. Bessie, who's watching for the very first time. Welcome, Bessie. Great to have you on board. Bessie says she's seen us sitting next to these lines now, and uh, you're not scared at all. But what was it like the very first time a lion walked past your vehicle? Well, Bessie, it's a little bit different for me. Um, I have been living in the bush since I was a baby. So the first time a lion walked past right next to me in a vehicle, I don't really remember. So, of course, having done that for the majority of my life, uh, I've never really been scared, and that's obviously because my dad never taught us to be scared. Uh, and a lion walking past the neck of the side of our car is about as normal as uh, stopping at a traffic light. Uh, and I've been very lucky in where I've lived and grown up, and I've grown up in some of the, the most far-flung wild places in Africa. I mean, at one stage, before boarding school, we even had a teacher that lived with us in the middle of the bush because uh, the schools were too far away and my mom didn't want us to send us off to boarding school when we were very little. So we had a teacher who lived with us out in the bush. So that was quite an experience. And my dad, being my dad, he's quite an unconventional fellow. When this poor teacher arrived and we all sat down to have a meeting about school and he said, what time would you like to start school in the morning? And the teacher said, nine o'clock. And my dad said, sorry, I was talking to the boys. And uh, we chose 6 a.m. So we were finished school by about 10, 10, 10 at 10.30 a.m. And the rest of the day, we were out, uh, out on the, on, in the wilderness with the anti-poaching guys, with the maintenance guys, with the rangers, with the trackers. So we <laughs> very very spoilt upbringing my brother and I had and my brother has actually after studying accounting and other stuff I don't really understand has uh, at the ripe old age of 28 decided to become a safari guide as well so 
Isn't that interesting, though? Huh? He's done full circle, and he also works in the Sabi Sands, but to the south of us. And this is what male lions do during the heat of the day, find a convenient little bit of shade and have a schnooze. Yes. Oh, it's tough. It's tough being at the top, big boy. And I say that in jest, but it is actually tough being at the top. Now, particularly because this is quite a big coalition of lions, they dominate quite a large area. And that takes quite a lot of effort and a lot of walking to make sure there's no interlopers coming in. And because of the high density of lions in this general area, uh, you find these big coalitions. Sorry, guys, I just need to be on the game drive quickly. Uh, one station with um, those four Birminghams. No station standing by from the east, so if anyone would like to come in here, there's two spaces available. That is affirmative. Okay. So, sorry about that. Chris has got actually quite an interesting question. When we first arrived at, at these lines this morning, um, I was controlling the sighting, and Chris would like to know what that entails. So, Chris basically, the person who finds, finds the animals has first choice and, and can stay pretty much as long as they want. Uh, and then we only have, in a sighting like this, nice open four male lines, we'll have a maximum of three vehicles in, in the sighting. So in terms of controlling the sighting, you control that the fact that the sighting doesn't become too busy. You don't suddenly have six cars all around pressurizing the animals. So what made this morning a little bit more challenging is that it is on a boundary. So we're on the southern edge of our traverse area, which is just over there. So there's a group of us who drive this side of the road and another group who drive that side of the road. We can't go there, they can't come here. So now being on a boundary makes it a little bit more difficult because you've got a whole host of vehicles from both sides wanting to see the lions. So how it works in this particular situation, they happen to be lying on our side of the road, which is this. So we have the northern guys, which is us. So uh, Safari Live, um, Taxon and Aubrey from Juma. Andrew and Ephraim from Cheetah Plains and the various different landowners from Buffalsock and Torchwood. So we have two vehicles. We have first choice in the sighting. And uh, the eastern guys and the western guys who use that main road have one vehicle. So if it happened to be the other way around and the lions were lying on the other side of the road, we would only be allowed one vehicle and they would be allowed two. Now, as it it is quite a challenge sometimes on these boundaries, uh, these sightings, to keep, keep everyone calm, because of course everyone wants to see the male lions. But fortunately, everyone was very civil this morning, and we managed to have a nice sighting, and everyone got to see them. And now, towards the end of the safari, we've come back here, and we're being spoiled again, like we started the safari. We are the only ones with them. But I think, they are, I think Ephraim might be coming here a little bit later. Uh, well, thank you, Aaron. Aaron says, don't fret, don't worry about the rugby scores. He doesn't like the Crusaders either. So I wonder what supporter you are, Aaron. Highlanders, Hurricanes, or Chiefs? So for our friends in the Northern Hemisphere, uh, our main, or one of our main sports in this part of the world is rugby. 
And uh, generally, the top three teams in the world all come from the Southern Hemisphere, and it's New Zealand, Australia, and South Africa. But uh, we are quite spoilt in that way, but we do enjoy our rugby. And it is quite, qu quite, a, quite a thing for a lot of us. We take rugby viewing very seriously. As I'm sure you guys do with your baseball and football. Boys need a little shampoo. Yes, they are quite filthy this morning. Now, if we zoom in on this guy's belly here, I think this is the guy who had that quite bad rash. It looks like it's healing quite well. And it's amazing, you can just see that dry skin there. So that rash was quite pink and raw, not even 10 days ago and it seems to have recovered quite nicely. And for a little bit, I was worried it might be mange, but it doesn't look like mange at all. And there we go, Chelsea was wondering about that rash that this male lion had. You can see it seems to be recovering quickly, and it's incredible how quickly these animals are able to recover from uh, various injuries and ailments. And often, as human beings, we look and think, oh, that's it game over for this guy but in three days later he looks happy as Larry and recovered again they have incredible constitutions well let's go have a look at the other two who are lying over there see if we can pick up any new scars or injuries on them and I really love getting to see male lions and as they get older the various different um, oh, look at that, that little bit of light in his eye. Um, as they get older, the various different scars and things that develop into really great characteristics. Now, we can see he's got a bit of a wound above his eye there. Oh, it looks, oh, it's a tick that's being scratched. It's very difficult to see sometimes with these guys. Oh, look at that. Did you see the dust as he breathed out there? Now, out of all the animals in the bush, nothing quite looks as comfortable as a male lion who's got a semi-full belly and fast asleep. So a male lion with an over-full belly looks very uncomfortable. But, I mean, look at this guy. He just looks like he's in seventh heaven. Not even moving. You can barely see him breathing even. So let's go look at those other two. Yes, very perturbed with our presence, I see. So the most amount of movement they're going to do today is a bit of rolling over. And as the sun obviously moves, uh, they'll keep moving into the shade. Maybe wander down to the pan in the distance for a little drink. I think they're going to spend the most of their day in La La Land. Now, let's have a look closely at this guy's face here, Dave. Uh, you can see he's got a nice little nick over there, a nice little scar, and a very distinct one, actually. There's a good one to remember him by, next to his nose on his upper lip. 
That looks like a scar that might stay for a while. So Mac, who's in Weezer, wonders if lions dream when they sleep like this. Well, Mac, I have seen lions dreaming, and they're very similar to what a domestic cat or domestic dog would do. You suddenly see the legs start moving. So I'm sure they're dreaming, or well, these guys in particular, are either dreaming of the Inkahuma ladies, but more than likely dreaming of chasing buffalo or something. Now, these boys are really, really expert buffalo killers. And they have often been found with multiple buffaloes. So not only catching one, but two. OK, so we're going to leave these guys sleeping. And we'll definitely come back and check on the sunset safari. But Jamie has got a massive group of pachyderms at Sydney's waterhole. Look at the stunning view that we have at Sydney's Dam at the moment. We've arrived just that little bit fractionally too late. Most of the elephant herd is moving off. They're done drinking. But not often we get a nice open view of as many elephants as we see here. Can we count quickly? 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18. Probably about 20, because that was a very rushed count. And lots of little ones as well. Oh, no, still thirsty. Going back for another drink. <laughs> Look how excited the little one is. The elephant water walk. What a beautiful sighting. I love watching the way elephants go to drink and they kind of swizzle the water around with their trunks first before drinking, just to get rid of any of the layers of dirt on top of it. Elephants are quite fussy drinkers. They much prefer being able to drink clean water. Which is why, even though we do still have a lot of groundwater, the elephants are still visiting the big dams. I prefer to have them water without mud. Thank you very much. And a sighting like this is just so typically African. It's beautiful. A big elephant at the back, one trunk full, easily 12 litres of water per trunk full. Enrique, while we are with this elephant herd, you were wondering a little bit about how likely it would be to see a group of elephants sleeping and do they hide away when they sleep? So, Enrique, first of all, elephants do sleep. Particularly, it's more likely to see it if they've got a group of youngsters with them. So, calves under three or so years of age do a tremendous amount of growing and as such, need as much sleep as possible. So very often we do encounter them sleeping in the middle of the day. And yes, they do like to hide away in the shade when they do that. But you could encounter an elephant sleeping at any point in the day. Generally, they don't sleep nearly as much as we do or for the extended periods that we do. It'll be a couple minutes of dozing. And believe it or not, even a fully grown elephant can, if they want to, lie down to sleep. They can also stand up and lean against a tree, maybe rest their trunks or their heads against a tree. That very much depends. Now, to maintain a body, a body weight that an adult elephant has, which can be between two to six tons, 4,000 4, pounds to 12,000 pounds in weight, they need to eat almost constantly. They also have very inefficient digestive systems. So the adults spend far less time asleep than the youngsters do. Youngsters have access to their mother's milk. So 
school. They don't need to feed as often as the adults will have to, which is why, one of the reasons why their sleeping periods are quite a lot shorter than ours. I have encountered elephants fast asleep in the bush before. The herds generally, as I said, like to hide away, but not necessarily all the time. And I've seen bulls, big male elephants, fast asleep in a clearing before, on quarantine clearings, once with its head like this against a marula tree, just fast asleep in that way. Uh, you could encounter them at any time seeing them sleep, but it is more likely when you've got a herd full of youngsters. Now, this particular elephant herd, they could well be fast asleep as we speak. Now, it seems as though Brent has got, now that ours have moved off, a much closer view of a herd of elephants. So, around the corner we came, and a big herd of Ellie's just causing a little bit of a roadblock for us. Hello. Now, great news we found Ellie's. Bad news where they're going. Uh-uh, what's your problem? Yes, you just keep walking. Uh, they are heading straight for those lions which is definitely not good news for us because they will definitely chase them. I'm hoping they drop into the Moati. So let's stick with these guys for a little bit. See where they go. Let's hope they don't walk straight down the road to the lions because then we definitely won't have any male lions on the sunset safari. Hello, big girl. It's OK. She's a little bit tense with us. I'm not sure why. She maybe just is not as relaxed as the other members of the herd. You can just see when I started the car, her tail became a bit stiff. So, hi, Kai, who's also a recent convert to the safari live. And I'd like to know how much water do elephants need in a day? Uh, a big male elephant can drink over about, a, or up to about 150 litres of water a day. Uh, but normally, a big female, around 100 litres, so quite a lot of water. Now, come, guys, turn left into the river, leave the lions alone. Looks like they're listening. That's quite fortunate for us. We would prefer them not to chase the lions away. So, Nokchua says elephants are very high on her bucket list of creatures to see while she's in South Africa. And she's coming in June. And she's going to be on a game reserve called Makalali. Well, Nokchua, you should ask Jamie about that, because that's where Jamie was before uh, joining Safari Live. And she was in charge of one of those volunteer programs. So, definitely, maybe on the Sunset Safari, Ask Jamie a few questions about that. So it's, we're getting close to the end of the, the sunrise safari. I'm just going to see if we can get another nice visual of these elephants as they go down towards the little Mawati riverbed. Fortunately, they stayed away from the lions.
water and has been a really exciting sunrise safari. We've got an unknown, unrelaxed male leopard on the property. Tingana is somewhere still around. We've got two in Kahuma girls and four Birmingham boys. So lots and lots of animals around. And of course, these wonderful elephants all in front of us. Oh, look at the one having a snooze. Now, you often find that with young Ellies when they're playing. There we go. So, Enrique, that one's not having a sleep, but you did ask Jamie about them sleeping. The young ones can actually sleep on their sides. The adults don't normally. They sort of doze standing up in the shade. And there we go. And it looks like they're going to rest before it gets too hot in this nice big thicket. We can hear a Warburg's eagle calling in the distance. So Gandalf says, wow, he thought lions would always chase off elephants. So elephants must be the true king of the jungle. That is very true, Gandalf. Elephants are the biggest, most dominant species we have here. Uh, lions will very seldom tangle with an elephant. They'll prefer to just get out of the way. So uh, elephants definitely are the kings and queens of the African bush. The lion is the king of the carnivores. So I'm try to see if we can have one last glimpse just before we say goodbye. So thanks to everyone for joining on this sunrise safari. And for the last couple of seconds, let's have a look at some Ellie's. And don't forget to join us on the sun set safari. And Jamie and I are gonna go see if we can find where that male leopard has left his kill. And hopefully we'll be able to find him on the sunset safari. But really exciting, new leopard, new adventure in just a few short hours. Bye-bye for now.